I don't really like it when people say, this is how you mix a kick drum, because to me that sounds kind of weird. Like a mix is mm. the mix of different elements that together create a song. So I'm mixing a song. And to me, there's no such thing as like, mixing a kick drum unless that's really the job like if i'm without context <laughs> having for whatever reason have to mix a kick drum but like i don't know so to me it's just one one part of the puzzle to the entire mix and we'll, we do whatever is necessary to make it work and this is really important because this could mean sometimes we barely need anything sometimes we need 10 plugins and crazy moves whatever the song needs and whatever the kick drum needs in order to work in the context of the song, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah no, I love that. We mix songs, not yeah. drums. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> That's totally. great. <laughs> this is the Self-Recording Band Podcast, the show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I'm your host, Benedict Hein. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're already a listener, welcome as well. Uh, we're so glad to have you again. This is part two of a little series that we started last week about kick drum processing in a mix. So we started with cleanup process, basically. So shaping the sustain of the kick drum with a gate and then cleaning it up with subtractive EQ. Then we talked about what to boost with EQ and how all those things go together. We talked a lot about the context of the mix and how we don't make these decisions in isolation. So just go back to last week's episode if you missed that one and start there because it's going to be relevant for this one too. We're not going to repeat all of the things we just said there uh, on last week's episode. So if you missed that one, stop right now, go back to the other one and then come back to this. Otherwise, it doesn't make um, sense or at least you don't get the full picture, I guess. So yeah. Today is part two, and we're going to talk about more, you know, tone, yeah, more tone shaping. And this time it's going to be saturation, clipping, compression, limiting, and how that, you know, goes together with our EQ decisions and all of that fun stuff. So, yeah, I'm all, I'm doing this with my friend and co host, as always, Malcolm Own Flood. Hello, Malcolm. How are you? Hey, Benny. I'm great, man. How are you doing? Doing good. Still, so we just awesome. recorded the other one, so we'll just keep going and record this one. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just jump right into this one, I think. The, the other thing I want to cover on this episode is also like mixed, because everything we've been doing, and again, you should really listen to episode one if you haven't, but like all of those EQs and, and you know, gating the kick drum, we're pretty much talking about our close mics. You know, we talked about the context of listening to it with the other mics, but we've been processing our kick drum mics. But we also want to make sure we address shaping the kick drum sound with the other mics that have a lot of kick drum. Namely, the rooms have a ton of kick drum. Um, and that could either be the most useful or the least useful thing, depending on your song. And and then, I mean, overheads also get a lot of kick as well, I would mm -hmm. say. So, like, they're part of this conversation as well. So, let's make sure we touch on that, too. 100%. Yep. Always in context. And, yeah, it's all in the beginning of the last episode. There's different levels of, of context and things to think about. And and also, that's why I said in the intro of the last episode, I don't like, I don't really like it when people say, this is how you mix a kick drum, because to me, that sounds kind of weird. Like a mix is mm. the mix of different elements that together create a song. So I'm mixing a song and the kick drum is part of that. And I might, I, I can tell you how we process kick drums in a mix in the context of the mix. But there's no, to me, there's no such thing as like, mixing a kick drum unless that's really the job like if i'm without context having <laughs> yeah. for whatever reason have to mix a kick drum but like i don't know so to me it's just one one part of the puzzle to the entire mix and we'll we do whatever is necessary to make it work and this is really important because this could mean sometimes we barely need anything sometimes we need 10 plugins and crazy moves whatever the song needs and whatever the kick drum needs to in order to work in the context of the song this is what we're going to do yeah yeah yeah, yeah, no, I love that. We mix songs, not kick yeah. drums. <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Great. So, okay, part two. After EQ, and I don't know, maybe it's even before EQ. I mean, we might have skipped a step for you there, Malcolm. For me, that I do cleanup, then sweetening EQ, and then I move to compression and other things. Maybe you have a compressor earlier yep. in the chain. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've got my, my EQ, which is kind of subtractive and additive, mm -hmm. all in one step. And then I'm okay, compressing. Good. So you, um, you, you boost. And, and just because I did mention in the last episode, there's that kind of exciting like saturation phase that I use to, to further shape it. But I usually do that after my compressor. Oh, okay. But this means you boost 
into compression also, right? The same way. Yeah, yes. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. And I have no problem yeah, me, doing me too. that. Me <laughs> too. I actually prefer it for various reasons. It's, I like the mm. how, and we're, we're going to get to that. So the compressor, depending on what we, how we push certain frequencies or part of the frequency range into that compressor, it will behave differently. And I like to play mm-hmm. around with that. And I like to have this kind of push and pull rubber band thing where even in later stages of the mix, if I decide to, oh, I, I might actually need a little more low end than I thought and I push some more, that will also make the compressor work differently. And I kind of like to hear that reaction and it, it, it's really what gets me sort of the vibe. And this is where I can really dial in the feel and the groove of the song. It's not just the EQ, it's how everything after the EQ changes and behaves if I change the EQ. That's really the fun stuff for me. Um, and there's totally. multiple layers to that because you got the compression on the actual kick, but then you maybe have a bu- drum bus compressor and a mix bus compressor and all those kind of change a little bit. So we, we're simply talking about kick today, but again, it's all about context and a simple eq move at the beginning of your chain might change how the entire song pumps on your mix bus for example so it's always everything affects everything yes yeah yeah i really don't understand the don't eq before your compressor argument is there such an argument i mean i've seen uh, people do uh, one or the other but is there a strong tendency towards not doing that or i I don't know i've definitely just like seen you know the youtube thumbnails like stop compressing before you or stop EQing before your compressor yeah, yeah, yeah. why you should never EQ before your compressor and it's just total nonsense it like it's no different than moving the microphone you know if you yeah. <laughs> move the microphone into a brighter spot get more yeah. beater that's going to change the relationship of your compressor like you, you just got to think of it as you're changing the source <laughs> 100% and I think maybe they do it because they want to prevent people you know they want to make sure that people don't accidentally change the behavior of the compressor by, you know, if you have, it's safer sort of to have the EQ after the compressor because if you change it, the compression stays the same. But yeah, it's not, but it's a different thing. And to me, there's a reason for why there's a switch in all these consoles that lets you put the compressor either before or after the EQ. Or many of them, the default is EQ before compressor. So, mm-hmm. you know, but there's a reason. So you can be intentional with that. And sometimes I might actually have to you know, there's always the the exception. I might have to compress before EQing for whatever reason, or I don't like how the compressor behaves totally. when I push the low end. But in general, I try to EQ into the compressor, and uh, I kind of like that response that I get by doing that. Another reason maybe why people teach not to do that is that on a traditional sort of analog channel strip of a console, you have the gain knob at the bo- at the top, and then you have an insert point, and that is usually the second thing in the chain, which is before the EQ. Then you have the EQ, then you have the sends, and then the fader. So if the console itself doesn't have a compressor, where your compressor usually sits in the chain is before the EQ. And those consoles, often yes. the smaller <laughs> consoles, also the live sound consoles, they don't have that pre-switch. Yeah. So if you insert a compressor into a channel, it just by default sits before the EQ. And maybe that's why people think this is the way to do it. But on like proper mixing consoles for the studio, the large format consoles, you have a switch where you can put it either before or after the EQ, and oftentimes the default will be after, so EQ before. Yeah. Just to be totally clear, I'm not opposed to doing it after the compressor either. It's like, it, there, there's nothing wrong about either way. It's just, if you make changes, it will obviously affect what comes after it. And the same is if you compress before your EQ, what your EQing is going to sound different too. So it's the exact same thing either way. The, the result will just be influenced by whatever you put first. Yeah. Absolutely. It doesn't matter which way you do it as long as you're being intentional and it sounds the way you want it to sound and that you're aware that the changes you're making are going to affect what whatever happens next. Yes, 100%. So, okay, I like bo- boosting into compressor for another reason as well, and that is that mm. the compressor kind of compensates... Or like, I don't know how to say it. For the kick drum, it's not as obvious as with other things. But for example, I push vocal top end into a compressor because it tends to get less sibilant overall because if it, if it goes too far in certain sections, the compressor will react to that excessive top end more and will compress even more the harsher it gets, basically. For a kick drum, maybe the same could be true, though. Like the harder hits of a kick drum or the, the varying degrees of low end, the compressor, to me, like kind of... How to say this? If I, let's let's put it differently. If I can make the c- compressor focus more on the stuff that matters with the kick drum, I feel like it does a better job of making that consistent. I don't actually want it to react to the stuff that I don't want in the kick drum, anyways. And if I can focus mm-hmm. it on the low end and the top end, and I can boost various you know varying degrees of that into the compressor, 
I feel like I get a more consistent low end and I get more control over the beater attack. And that's, uh, to me, at least another benefit. I feel like if I compress before the, the EQ too much, then certain hits will be a little clickier than others and the low end will be less controlled. And yeah, it's just to me a more consistent kind of thing. It's hard to describe, but you have to try it. It's, it's, yeah, that's no, what I'm experiencing. I do understand that. Yeah. Yeah, like I think we've talked about this on a, another episode about using like a bus compressor to give you the boxes like of your painting that you're going to yeah. paint inside and a compressor on a single channel kind of can do that as well where it's like getting this compressor in there kind of gives you something to EQ into and and it starts reacting and and feels more cohesive in a way um and then where yeah those those super loud hits don't jump out quite as much as they used to it just seems a little more uniform which i mean that's that's yeah definitely a reason to use compressors to get things more uniform 100 <laughs> percent, um, yeah totally okay yeah, mm -hmm. i do agree though yeah, yeah I, I it seems like we're the same there yeah we kind of have that compressor after some eq yeah now what about malcolm how what do you do with the compressor like why do you even compress and how do you set it to achieve whatever you're going for mm -hmm. This is really something that is never the same mm -hmm. for me. But I do think of it very again holistically in much to the same much to the same way that what I'm thinking about when I'm EQing and often kind of at the same time even like that I'll be messing with the EQ and the compressor kind of going back and forth because at the end of the day I want that attack to sound right to me and I want that low end to to feel big and and awesome and how it's meant to be for the song as well and the combination of that eq and that compressor really matter for both of those things especially the top end actually i think the attack can change so much depending on how you set your compressor's attack to to grab that transient and so if i i like i might go really fast or i might if i like want to modify the attack a lot I'll make the, the attack time on my compressor super fast and grabby and then like find that sweet spot there to totally change the attack and click of my kick drum. But if I love it, I'll go slower and let that transient through and, and try and get out of the way of that transient so that I'm not modifying it too much there, right? And the, the sustain of the drum will get altered in the step two, but actually not that much for me because I've done so much of that with my first step in back in episode one of the series with the the gate i've kind of got the decay of the drum pretty figured out um so i'm I'm not too worried about that with the compression stage it's more of an attack shaping thing for me and like a density kind of thing like how much of an uh, yeah. do i get out of it yeah totally i think in most cases though unless you're going for a really long release which is kind of uncommon i think for drums i think in most cases you'll you'll likely to extend the sustain a little bit though just by compressing usually the the sustain comes up a little bit or the room comes up a little bit if you compress harder so i guess that just happens but it's not what you focus on when you're compressing right yeah. no no yeah and yeah obviously i'm going to be aware of the sustain yeah. and, and you know use the release knob for sure but it's like what i'm really mm -hmm. thinking about is more so the like yeah. the attack of the drum is that sounding great this is really where it should we should be pretty close at this point Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So it's actually pretty similar for me as well. So sometimes if I'm going for more punch, like a harder hitting kick drum sort of, and like I will go for a longer attack time, let the transient through, then let the compressor clamp down on like on it shortly after the transient and, and just shape it. I feel like it's pretty with kick drums, it's pretty obvious to hear it for me at least, like with some experience where if I go too fast, the kick drum just gets small and, and just it's a fine line there, so I can I can add more punch to it to a certain degree, but at some point it just gets very narrow and tiny and small and like weird. It doesn't sit much mm -hmm. like really well anymore, especially if you leave the longer attack. If you leave if you let the transient through, it can get become this short clicky transient thing that you often don't really want for a kick drum. If you yeah. so, but but usually that's what I do: long long attack and then just enough to make it sit well to get the punch that I want, and then that's basically it. I control the transients in a separate step afterwards that we'll get to. Sometimes it's rare for me, and I think much more rare than much rarer than for you, Malcolm. But sometimes I might use an eleven seventy six or something really fast, or I will turn the you know attack knob on the SSL into fast attack mode or peak mode or whatever, and I can, and I will make the compressor immediately react to the transient, which makes the kick drum sit differently in the mix. Like it's going to be very consistent. It's going to be 
the transient will be a little softer, but at the same time, there will be a kind of a different kind of punch added to it. And this kind of, it's so hard to explain this with words, but yeah, I've seen you do this in a mixes unpack thing where I think you, you've compressed the kick drum with an 1176 and pretty short attack times. Yep. Uh, but and you compressed the hell out of it, and it still sounded slammed. Yeah, it. <laughs> and it still sounded punchy, and so I feel like I can't do that that often. It just the kick seems to disappear if I do that. But sometimes it's the move, um, and yeah, uh, but, but it all depends on the context of the song. It's just important for you to know that the attack is very critical here. It's you got to be very intentional about yeah. this, and you just the best way to learn this is to, I think to. Uh, turn the threshold down so far that you do a lot of compression, use a high ratio, just over compress the, the hell out of the kick drum, and then just start with a very, very short attack time, like the, the shortest one, and then gradually increase it and listen to what happens because you will hear the tran at some point the transient will come through, it will be very narrow and pokey and clicky, then more and more of the entire kick drum will come through till you reach a point where basically all of it hits you and only the sustain is compressed, and then you turn down the amount of compression and do that again until you you know you really find that sweet spot that you want for your kick drum but you got to learn how the different attack settings change the entire shape of your kick drum transient basically yeah yeah and it, it does take practice to be able to like hear that accurately to be able to like hone in on on just the what's changing with the attack knob but once you get it, it's like riding a bike, you've got it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what I like to do um, instead of the super fast compression usually on kicks is I like to do the slower one to add more punch and only do a few, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of compression usually. And then I will afterwards push it into a clipper though or a limiter, which is a limiter is kind of the same what you're doing with the 1176. It's just a separate thing again for me where I feel like I have the punch, but maybe now it's just the transient is a little too hard and it's, I don't get right. the, the full oomph of the kick drum that I really want. And to control that, and especially the louder hits, to make it more consistent, I will then push it into maybe even a pretty destructive limiter like an L1 or something, or into a, um, a clipper. And clippers can be awesome because to me they also add some grit to the beater attack and they they add a certain quality that i just like in terms of how the attack sounds you just have to be careful because clipping or heavily limiting as well also usually means that low mid-range frequencies creep up so you get this kind of you know exactly what i mean right um uh, malcolm where you get this yeah. upper bass lower mid-range thing that gets louder all the time and then it gets saturated at some point and it adds this weird resonance to the kick that you actually don't want. So this is one of those yeah. things, if I do that, I this is one of those things where I actually have to go back to my subtractive EQ and remove even more of the 150 or whatever that I did just after crushing it because that stuff will creep up again and then will add this weird quality to the, the low end that I don't want. Yeah, yeah. Clippers can get really bad on, on low end information um, if you're not careful. So it is like definitely a, I'm, I'm pretty cautious and, and tend to avoid clippers for that reason, but they, they totally can work. You're right. Um, and like, I think it sounds like we're both kind of getting to the same point mm -hmm. though, where we're shaping the attack. We really emphasize that, like the getting the attack of your kick drum sound at this part is really crucial, but we're also trying to deal with the consistency of the hits. Yeah. Um, because unless you're, drummer is just fantastic there's probably some hits that are just a little quieter than others that aren't meant to be you know like there's there's more dynamics than you actually want in the performance of the drum so we need to try and narrow that and get them more uniform so that it's just like more consistent through yeah. the song and obviously you can go too far with that but generally where you're starting from there's too much dynamics yeah. so this is also a part where we're trying to level some of that out yeah absolutely Quick pro tip here, and this is not one of the essential things that you need to do. So if you do all the things we just talked about, you're usually, you know, fine. And it's like, you're going to be in the ballpark and it's more than like, absolutely, in, in most cases, it's going to be enough. But there's always the exception. And I'm going to give you something that works really well for me, but don't feel like you have to do that on every single kick drum. But the logic behind it is really interesting. That's why I wanted to bring it up. So usually with a kick drum, if you hit it, like if you have the problem that you just described, Malcolm, with like an inconsistent drummer, too much dynamics, actually. So if you hit a kick drum quietly, it usually also means not just less volume, but it means longer low end and more low end in relation to like the beater attack. So you have instead yeah. of a you know hard hitting kick drum hit, you got a mm, sort of 
soft, low end, and less speeder attacks. So the, the the sound changes as well, not just the the volume. And whereas on the like really hard hits, especially if the the drummer is like burying the beater, then you might have a very short low end because the beater just they just stick the beater into the head and the low end is kind of choked. But you have the massive sort of punch and beater attack. And so there will be a difference in sound. And for me to make that more consistent, if that is not intentional or if it's just too much or more than I want to to have, to make that more consistent, you can use something like a, you can use a multiband compressor slash expander. So you need something like Pro MB by Fab Filter or something like that, where you can switch the bands from compression to expansion. I'm going to explain really quick what that means. So two bands, one is controlling the low end, one is controlling the upper mid range where the beater attack is. Now you set the beater attack thing, like the, the upper mid-range band, you set that to compression so that it reduces it when the signal exceeds the, the threshold, and the low end you set to an expander so that every time the signal is loud and it goes past the threshold, it actually boosts some low end. So that way, every time mm -hmm. a loud hit comes in, the thing does this. It ducks the presence and boosts the low end, and on the quiet hits, it stays kind of the same. And that way, yeah. the louder hits are have a more controlled beater attack, but an additional low end boost, and the choir hits kind of stay, stay the same. And so that is something you can do. And what's just important to realize about that is that consistency is so important that the source really matters, and that a louder kick drum hit is not is usually not just louder unless it's a one shot that's exactly the same. It means it also sounds different. And our goal with all the kick drum shaping that we just described in these two episodes is to make the song feel good and usually and, and to make to get the groove right and usually this this requires some level of consistency and we need to do whatever we can to achieve that and with many especially natural drum performances where it's not programmed and you can't really do anything about it you just have to you know mangle it and crush it and whatever to to make sure that actually happens yeah yeah that it's it's a really clever way actually of if trying to compensate for that performance deficiency it doesn't like we we both know that it doesn't actually do it <laughs> it makes it better yeah. and like sonically more consistent but like there, there there's just a different yeah. sound yeah. to to a hard hit right so like always get your drummer to hit harder yeah. <laughs> more consistently consistently but but like yeah it, it's you have got to do what you got to do essentially and that is one one method of getting it a little bit closer, and all these things add up. Absolutely, and then just standard limiting does a part of the job as well. Like we said before, it's just uh, also consistency, where you just basically in terms of just levels, also how hard you hit your drum bus compressor and the mix bus compressor. So you want to control your kick drum to a degree that if you send that finished sort of shaped kick drum and the snare and all of that, if you send that to your drum bus or the mix bus or both, then you just want to make sure that whatever is happening there is seeing an actual groove and not like a thing that's mm -hmm. all over the place dynamically. So you just want to make sure that the yeah. peaks, if you look at the meter of your final sort of kick drum channel or group or whatever you have, it always depends on the genre. And if you're making jazz or whatever, like there could be, you know, drastic differences in dynamic or whatever. But like if you're doing any sort of modern rock, pop, heavy music, whatever, usually the meter pretty much looks the same for every single hit. It's just, you, you just lock it in. And then you can write, write automation to make it more dynamic and that stuff. But before you add the intentional dynamics, I try to control the dynamics that are already there as much as possible so that I can then actually control them, if that makes sense. So I try to make it consistent first and then add back whatever dynamics I think it needs for the song because I yep. want my bus compressors to see a groove that is working together and is kind of predictable and because that is what makes us move to the music so yeah yeah no i i totally i agree with that it's like it's a pretty advanced concept and so if you don't understand that yet don't worry yeah. about it just like <laughs> it's a it'll stew in the back of your brain for a little bit and then one day it'll click but uh, yeah it's there's a lot of doing something that seems bad to make it good later in mixing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what do you do in terms of color or other things? Because that's typically it for me. I might have a parallel yeah. bus, you know, I might have a drum crush that I send stuff to. Do, but it's always these things. Like I use saturation or clipping tools to add the color and a little bit of grit to the attack. And there's no rules there. You really yeah. have to find the tool that you like and experiment with that. Be careful with the low end though. Maybe just saturate the beater attack, the top end or whatever, you know, certain things. 
Then there's EQ and then there's compression. That's pretty much it for me. But I don't know, maybe you do specific other things to shape the kick drum or add some character or color. That, like, that's pretty much it as well. I mean, after that compressor is where I do my saturation. And like, like I mentioned, backspace, I think. Maybe that was in the last episode. But like, I'll, I'll start get adding density through harmonics to the kick drum after that. And it, it's, again, quite subtle usually, but it like just kind of gets it where I want it. And then, yeah, this is where I really start thinking about the drum even larger <laughs> in, the, in the scope of the mix. And we've, we've talked about how you need to be listening to it in context all throughout this and just constantly checking it with your mix. But this is like now where I'm going to be like, okay, can I use these room makes to really make this drum explosive, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's where you can really get creative. And it's not that every mix needs this, but like one fun example, just to kind of give people an idea of like how far you can go, is you could sidechain or like duplicate your room mics, for example, and then sidechain it to a kick drum like signal so that it only plays the room mics when the kick drum gets hit. So you've got this like explosive room mic sample, essentially, you've made with your real room mics. And, and then you EQ that to... To hell, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and make it whatever you need to be the perfect kick drum room, you know, and and it doesn't you don't you don't worry about the bleed because it's only firing when it's been side chained from the kick drum signal, and th there's to make that happen is more complicated than that, but it's like that's an example of like how far you could go with using the rest of your kit to to make the kick drum sound cool, and like if you have a really wide room mic setup that you're doing something like that with, it's now now your drum stereo, you know, you've got this big splash coming left and right on the kick drum hits as well so it's like a very dramatically different thing all of a sudden so all that to say after this core stuff that benny and i both seem to kind of do very similarly yeah. this is where i get really creative and see what else is possible absolutely agreed 100 percent. yeah this is really about context then and about automating things up and down i might be i might even mm -hmm. do that what you just said with the explosive room mics i might just bring it up for a certain part maybe the song in general is like too yeah. fast or too dense for that but then there's this one breakdown with tons of room in between the ki the, the hits and then i will just automate the the room mics up compress them hard and then this one part will completely explode or you know things like that or there's the quiet verse or bridge where i might mute the the room mics entirely or make them very yep. quiet so totally. that it all becomes like very intimate and small you know really creative stuff and it all affects the the kick drum but the mix as a whole oh this is actually one very important thing that just comes to mind here with automation one thing that i ran into quite often in the past where artists often like made me aware of that more than i i noticed it myself is and now i i'm very aware of that and do it all the time is where i might have a kick drum sound that really works for the song and i will automate it up and down you know whatever i need but then sometimes if there's a quieter part or a certain the beginning of a verse or whatever where it's not really there's not a lot of energy and the band is not playing like super loud or like it shouldn't feel like a band playing super loud i oftentimes had the kick pretty much the same still because it didn't bother me i like the consistency but then often artists pointed out to me hey that like the kick here is sounds like it's hitting way too hard so we need to turn that down and not just the volume but the mm -hmm. way it sounds and now i'm yeah. very aware of that that when there's actually a, a quiet verse and the snare is quieter or there's like a, yeah more detail in that or it's an intimate sort of thing i make sure that i might not i, I will not just automate down the kick i might actually use the clip gain again or push less into my compressor or like change the beginning of the chain to make that part less aggressive because it sounds kind of weird if you mm -hmm. turn the kick drum down but it still sounds like a full-on hit all the time right in a part like that so sometimes yeah. you have to make changes to the beginning of the chain to not change the volume only but to change the entire feel and to get give the song that kind of relief for that moment before it hits hard again so totally yeah that, that that's a great note yeah it's, it all comes back to context again yeah. it's like we're we're mixing a song, not a kick drum. So if you've been doing all of this, like this entire process that we've been talking about, just listening to the last chorus, the loudest part of the song, when you go back to the quiet verse, you might be sorely disappointed in the decisions you've made. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be careful about that and make sure, like you are making decisions that are going to benefit the song as a whole. And and often that will mean making automation changes throughout different parts of the song, but. While I'm doing this, this kind of like first mixing pass, I am trying to make something that's like a broad decision yeah. for the whole song. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, you know what's interesting, Benny? I'd love your thoughts on this. Normally, I'm kind of prioritizing the loudest part of the song. Yeah, same. Because I don't want to make decisions on the quiet part and try and make it hit really hard. And then I get to the loud part and it just like everything blows up because yeah. it's so much louder. And that makes sense to me. Well, what was my train of thought there? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I really don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> I, 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 I convinced myself that there was a reason I might want to do it the other way around. But now I'm like, no, no, I definitely like doing the loud stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we just keep that in there. It's gone. I don't know. No, but Maybe. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, for me, I definitely start with the, the loudest parts of the song because I feel like it's easier to reduce the amount of processing and make it less intense but still uh, retain sort of the the character that I and the, the sort of vibe that I created versus mm -hmm. trying to mix a quiet verse where I might not need to do much for it to work and then the chorus comes in and it's just too soft or whatever or I'm yeah I just doesn't make sense to me like I, I start with the louder part for sure for various reasons also for yeah. gain staging reasons on like the mix bus and all of that it has to be yeah absolutely yeah always always do that and then work my way backwards sort of from there, or I will, not backwards, but I will start with the loudest part, usually, to get the levels and game staging and general vibe right. The loudest part mm -hmm. is oftentimes also kind of the climax of the song, the most important part, where it's like, okay, this really has to hit hard, and this is like the most important thing. And then, so I need also all the objectivity and, you know, fresh ears and everything to make good decisions there. And then, I will usually jump back right to the beginning of the song, regardless of whether that's a quiet or loud part, and then just work my way through the song. Because from there, once I got the loudest part right, I think the next and most important thing is that the beginning of the song is absolutely right. So this is the first thing listeners hear. And then I just work my way through the song part by part, usually. So, Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds about the same to me. Just keep in mind that you will want to make things less intense, potentially. So if you have kind of like some ideas of how you'd pull that off in mind, uh, it could stop you from painting yourself into a corner, I yeah. guess. And there's all sorts of ways you could automate just the the parameters of the plugins you've used, like back down. So maybe you need to lessen that a super intense attack you built in with an EQ. So you could just automate that down for a section. Maybe it's just as simple as like a dry, wet, dry knob, and you can just automate the mix down to be less intense. You know, or maybe it's simply volume. Yeah. You know, just gotta. Or as Benny suggested, clip game is a really great way to do it because then you're just driving the, the processing you've applied less hard. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Good. I think there's lots to think about already. And uh, let me know, as always, let us know if you have any anything you like to do to your kick drums, any special you know, creative things you discovered or whatever. Just let us know there's a million ways to treat a kick drum in a mix. And uh, we yep. always love to hear new and exciting approaches as well. Uh, but I think... For most people, it's a really good idea to start with those basics to get the levels and the balance right, to have good source tones, to EQ properly, compress properly, and then you're basically pretty much there. And everything else is like creative, you know, add-ons, nice to haves. But if you have a good sounding kick drum that fits the song and you EQ that well and you compress it just enough but not too much, you should be there. So absolutely yeah now i've i've got an idea for an episode and i would love to hear from listeners if they want it but this was kind of how to process a kick drum in a normal setting but what if we did an episode on how to mix a really terrible kick drum? Like, <laughs> well, we you can't do use that. this so what do you do oh you know? also, okay oh i thought you were you were talking about creating a really terrible result and i was like no, why, not, no, why would i dealing with something really bad because yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. th these decisions yeah. were based on it being workable um yeah. and under the assumption that like the job's been done to uh, an adequate degree of tracking yeah. these or whatever. And you uh, getting okay. and you mean like we can't just replace it? We have to deal with whatever we have because the uh, simple well, solution would be maybe, just replace maybe, it. Maybe, but like I, I think I think there's multiple ways you could go because I would say even with a really terrible kick drum, there's usually one oh, yeah. good quality mm -hmm. in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it won't be the kick drum, but it might be a piece of it. You know, so maybe there's a fascinating polishing turds episode series we could go down <laughs> maybe yeah may, or it could be a topic for like youtube videos where we actually show how that would sound or whatever because mm, like yeah. how do you describe terrible kick sound but yeah but good, good good idea though good idea though i love i love that that's actually a good idea in general so maybe we should do more episodes on how to fix or deal with less than ideal recordings because at the end of the day if you're being honest that's what we deal with often with like self-recording bands. It's like just the reality. So if you're recording yourself, chances are you're not at that level yet where you record, a, you know, produce world-class sort of recordings and what you capture is going to be pretty raw and, you know, not saying it's terrible, but 
usually there's problems. There'll probably be something in there that you screw up. <laughs> yeah, chances are are that there is that there are. Yeah, yeah, good, good idea. Very cool, very cool. Let me think about that. Great. Now, hope that was helpful. And again, let us know in the comments. If you're listening, watching on YouTube, let us know in the comments. If you are listening on your podcast app, leave a review and tell us there if you find this helpful. Haven't asked you for that in a while, I think. And uh, join our Facebook group. It's still growing every single week. So apparently people are still on Facebook and we are in there as well. And, and you know, uh, taking care of that community over there. And yeah, thank you for listening. That's all I can say. <laughs> thank you very much. See you next week. Bye. <laughs>